you know, you might think about this. The right order of life is that my will tells my mind what to do and my mind tells my body what to do. My body obeys it. When I get messed up, my body is in charge. My appetites and my mind becomes obsessed with that and then my will gets enslaved to whatever my appetites are. Hey, change starts today. So let's get after it and ask God's help, particularly what we're going to look at. We were talking recently about prudence, and I had just gone on a walk with a friend through the Santa Cruz Mountains. We got off the path, so I had to scramble up through old dry riverbeds, lots of bushes, lots of scratches. I have ended up with rashes all over my skin, driving me crazy right now. Now, you might think it wasn't prudent to take a walk. No, 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 no. Prudence doesn't involve risk avoidance. Prudence is doing what is wise. And I would do that walk again in a heartbeat. We were making a memory. We were having a conversation. What that walk leads to is the need for another character strength. And that character strength is self-control. The ability to regulate what it is that I think and what it is that I feel and what it is that I do might be summarized like this. Just because my body says I itch doesn't mean I have to scratch. Now, here's what's interesting. Out of all the 24 character strengths, when people rate themselves, they often say, I do pretty good with kindness or pretty good with honesty, maybe, or pretty good with teamwork or creativity. Self-control comes in dead last. Um, people uniformly feel really bad about their capacity for self-control. When they talk about what their problem is, they put that at the top of the list. Now, this has probably shifted somewhat over the years. This gets deeply into issues of character. I'm going to talk today some from Roy, Roy Baumeister's book, Willpower. And he writes about a shift that took place. Alan Wheelers, the psychoanalyst, psychiatrist who revealed this that Freudian therapies no longer worked the way that they were supposed to. And here's what Wheelis found. Um, in Freud's day, the Victorian era had a big emphasis on character and building character that actually worked in people's lives. So Freud found that people had intensely strong wills, made it hard for the therapist to break through their defenses. But once they did, once people saw why they were neurotic and miserable, then they, they, when they achieved insight, they could change rather easily. By mid-century, though, people's character armor was different. Wheelis and his colleagues found that people achieved insight faster than in Freud's day. But then the therapy often stalled and failed, lacking the sturdy character of the Victorians. People did not have the strength to follow up on their insight and change their lives. Fascinating shift in the emphasis on what we're talking about, which is the building of character. Baumeister goes on to talk about how so many problems in our day increase divorce rates, um, abuse and violence in the home, rising crime rates, and so on, uh, are the problem of what he calls self-regulation failure. Self-regulation failure, he says, is the major social pathology of our time. What is self-regulation failure? Well, it was described this way a couple thousand years ago by a man named Paul when he was writing to a church in Rome. I have a desire to do good, but I can't carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the bad I do not want to do, this I keep doing. This is our great problem. So self-control gets deeply, deeply into the notion that you were created to have a kingdom. The kingdom is the range of your effective will, but with a lack of self-control, my will is no longer effective. And so Proverbs 25, 28 says that a person who lacks self-control is like a city whose walls are broken down, vulnerable to attack from any different direction. Or when Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, and so, the climax of the list is self-control. Or Paul says to his young friend Timothy, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but of power and of love and of self-control. Now, here's what you need to know about your stock of self-control. This is Baumeister again. Studies of thousands of people have demonstrated two central lessons. Number one, you have a finite amount of willpower, and it becomes depleted when you use it. Quite famously, he often says it's like a muscle. You do push-ups, and then eventually you can't do any more push-ups till you rest a while. 
Second lesson, you use the same stock of willpower for all manner of tasks. You might think you have one reservoir of self-control for work, another for dieting, another for exercise, another for being nice to your family. But that is not true. Completely unrelated tasks, like resisting temptation and then persevering and trying to solve a problem, both draw on the same energy. And this has been demonstrated over and over. You use the same supply of willpower to deal with frustrating traffic, tempting food, annoying colleagues, demanding bosses, pouting children. Resisting dessert at lunch leaves you with less willpower to praise your boss's awful haircut. And that's a real problem for us because we have a lot of things that require regulation. Researchers divide the areas where we need willpower into um, uh, four dimensions. Uh, I need it for my thoughts. I can obsess over, I got this problem, can't stop thinking about work, can't stop thinking about that person, can't stop thinking about that memory. And then feelings, man, I just find myself irritable. Come on, snap out of it. Or I just seem to be sad or in the blues today. Or then impulses, eat this, drink this, watch this, buy this, wear this, say that. The impulse control becomes an area that demands willpower. And then performance, go for a job interview or go on a first date with somebody or have a meeting with your team and the boss is there and you don't want to look stupid. And so our willpower gets depleted. We have habits and we want to break them. And then that takes willpower. I want to try to eat right. I want to maybe go on a diet or I want to try to pray to God more often or I want to try to be more encouraging to other people. And all these things deplete our willpower. And you will be able to tell when your willpower is depleted because you feel more easily frustrated. You feel less energy. You have a harder time making a decision. You get more easily irritated. Um, there's a uh, a little bit written uh, by an English writer, Sir A.P. Herbert. Thank heaven I've given up smoking again. Now, giving up smoking takes willpower. God, I feel fit. Homicidal, but fit. A different man. Irritable, moody, depressed, rude, nervy perhaps, but the lungs are fine. And here's the problem. We cannot live just white-knuckling it trying to exercise more and more self-control over our unruly thoughts and feelings and impulses, and we were not meant to. Another fascinating discovery by Baumeister. Um, you could sum up a large body of research with this simple rule. The best way to reduce stress in your life is stop screwing up. And he goes on to talk further about what he means about this. Ironically, this is fascinating. People who have more self-control don't use their willpower to try to control all of their thoughts and feelings and avoid disasters. Here's what they found. Um, people who have more self-control have less need to use willpower because they're beset by fewer temptations and inner conflicts. They're better ar at arranging their lives so they avoid problem situations. People with good self-control mainly use it not for rescue in emergencies, but rather to develop effective habits. Nancy, you're going to hate this, the habit word. And routines in school and at work. People with high self-control consistently report less stress in their lives. They use their self-control not to get through crises, but to avoid them. This is the secret of the easy yoke. They engage in a way of life so that I will naturally think thoughts that are true and have desires and emotions that are healthy and perceive the presence of God in other people so that I want to help them and have impulses to action that will be good and contribute value around me. Now, this brings up something very deep about the spiritual life and willpower that takes us beyond secular psychology. This I thought was fascinating. Uh, uh, writer Ezra Sullivan, Catholic thinker, said that uh, Baumeister's view of the will as a kind of muscle has one problem. 
He said, our muscles are blind. If you want to, you can lift any kind of weight, doesn't matter what, could be barbells or you could use cables or body's resistance, but our will is not that way. The will is not blind. The will is attached to our intellect and we know what is good. And it turns out with the will that, you know, my big problem is I have an appetite. I, I want to do this, but I know this is good. I have a conscience. Now, if I, if I choose to move in the direction of my conscience over time, my will for what is good will grow stronger. It will become more habitual. But, but if I habitually uh, choose to just give in to what I know to be bad because it'll gratify my desire, my will becomes more enslaved. My will becomes weaker. The will is not just like a muscle. The will has a need. Um, you know, you might think about this. The right order of life is that my will tells my mind what to do and my mind tells my body what to do, my body obeys it. When I get messed up, my body is in charge, my appetites and my mind becomes obsessed with that and then my will gets enslaved to whatever my appetites are. In our day, we call that addiction. In the Bible's day, it was called idolatry. So actually, the great need is for my will not to simply be in charge. My will needs to be surrendered and it will. It will either be surrendered to my body, appetites, that sort of thing in the wrong order, or my will will be surrendered to what is good. To seek to serve the truth and love and peace and joy and, and uh, all of the good is found in God. And then my mind will be ordered in that direction. And then my body will become the servant to all of that. So. Here's the takeaway from all this today. Now, you may have lots of things that you want to be working on. You may have habits that you want to change. You may have goals in your life. That's good. Um, don't choose too many. Don't try to do too much because your little will will be easily depleted. But I have one real simple goal for you today. There is one act of the will that does not deplete it, that actually strengthens and does not rob it, and it is surrender. And you can do it right now. Just take your hands and open them up like this and say these words, God, your will be done. I want your will for my life, God. I want my little will. I can't. You can. I want my little will to be surrendered to your great and good will. And then all today, I'm going to do this today. Whenever you think about it today. Now, you've already done it once, so it's a win. You hit the goal. Um, you're doing it. But today, whenever the thought comes to mind, whenever you're confused, whenever you find yourself tempted, whenever there's a thought you don't want to think or a feeling you don't want to feel or an impulse you don't want to give into or a performance that you feel like you're not up to, your will be done. I can't, he can't. Change is coming today. Tim, thanks for joining us. Before you leave, you can subscribe to this channel or like this video or comment on the video. We love to read those comments. We read them every day, so we'd love to hear from you there. If you'd like to receive the emails that go along with each video, you can let us know at becomenew.com slash subscribe. Or if you have a prayer request, we would love to pray for you. You can text that request to 855-888-0444. See you next time.